Welcome to the Emerging Minds Families Podcast. Hi, I'm Nadia Rossi and you're listening to an Emerging Minds Families Podcast. We would like to pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We also pay respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging from the different First Nations across Australia. When stigma happens to our families, it can be really hard to know how to respond. But there are many ways that families can and do respond to stigma, discrimination and injustice to hold on to their family's dignity and support their children's well-being. This podcast is a part of a series where we explore some of the ways families do this. Maybe you will connect with some of their stories and skills, or maybe they will spark some ideas for facing stigma in your own family. In this episode, we are talking about parenting with a disability and the stigma that many parents with a disability and their children have to navigate. Our guest today is Eliza Hull. Eliza Hull is an award-winning musician, writer and disability advocate. She is the creator of the ABC podcast series, We've Got This, about parenting with a disability. She also edited and created the book with the same title, We've Got This, Essays by Disabled Parents which features parents who identify as disabled, deaf or chronically ill. Eliza has appeared on TV and radio using her lived experience of disability to reduce stigma and we are excited to have her as a guest on our podcast today. Welcome Eliza, it is great to speak with you. Thank you very much for having me. Eliza, can you tell us a bit about who makes up your family? Yeah, so I am a mother of two. I have a eight-year-old girl, Isabel, and a three-year-old, just about to turn four, little boy called Archie, and then my husband as well, Carl. Eliza, you live with Shaka Marie too. Can you describe to us what that is? Yeah, so it's kind of complicated to talk about because it, you know, it can affect people very differently, but it is a nerve disorder. And so that means that I have what is called like a, a, a myelin sheath around the, the nerves and it actually has holes in that. And so it means that the messages find it difficult to reach, especially areas like the hands, uh, feet, legs. Um, I've had it since I was five years old. And uh, the reason that my parents started to notice that something might be a little different was just that I started to fall over at school most days. And then I was taken to lots of hospital appointments and, and finally diagnosed with Charcot Mari tooth. It does affect me, you know, differently every day. I guess for me, it's like, you know, fatigue easily. I'm in pain. I have muscle spasms. I guess the most visible part of my disability is the way that I walk. So I, I do walk, you know, very differently and I can't get upstairs because of muscle loss. I still fall over a lot to, even today. And it also affects my hands as well and, and my, you know, even my internal organs. So it's kind of one of those disabilities that can affect all parts of your body, but I guess in more visible ways than, you know, is, is the way that I walk. But, you know, many people with CMT are wheelchair users. Some walk and some are diagnosed really late in life. Some people don't even know they have uh, CMT until they're, you know, in their 60s. So it is, you know, one that really affects people very differently. Thank you for sharing that with us. You mentioned you are a mother of two. Can you tell us about your experience when you decided to become a parent? Yeah, so I, you know, was really excited. I'd met the person that I wanted to have kids with and I really had always wanted to have kids, you know, even since being a young person. I remember saying to mum and dad, that's what I wanted to do in my life is, you know, have do all the things with my career, but also be a mother. And when we decided to become parents, uh, I went to my neurologist who I'd been really seeing since I was quite young. And so we had formed a, a relationship and he was somebody I really trusted as well. And so I went to him and said, I would have decided that we'd like to start potentially trying for children. And I think that's when I really noticed how much stigma there is when it comes to parenting with disability. And, you know, he's, he's a kind person, but the way that he really handled it was you know, in my opinion, not not positive at all. Um, you know, he really was silent for a while and then reading on the computer without giving me much eye contact and then uh, said to me that he didn't think that I could manage being a parent and, you know, was worried. 
that, you know, what if I fell over or would I be able to, you know, do all the things that parenting requires. Uh, he also was nervous about the, the fact that I could pass on my disability as well. There is a 50% chance. Uh, at this point, both my children are not showing any symptoms of my disability. But I think that, you know, that that can bring up a lot of shame and, and vulnerability when someone starts to question whether you should have a child because they'll be like you. Um, it hurts. So, uh, you know, at that time, I just, you know, if I'm completely honest, I, I really kind of almost thought, well, you know what, maybe you're right. Maybe I can't do this. And I went back to my partner and, and said what, what had happened. And he was like, actually, you know, this is this is not true. Like, you know, we can do this and we can do it as a team. And I think that you really need to to kind of not listen to this medical professional. And, and thank goodness, you know, my partner was there to support me because now we have a great family. And yes, I might do things differently, but I, I make a great mother. And did that start you on a journey of finding the right practitioner for you? So from there, what did you do? I never went back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I never went back and I actually don't have a neurologist to this day. So I I tried to to create a different team around me. So now I feel like I really have people on my side, but that's taken a long time to find the right people to work with me with my disability. What would you like those who live with disability who want to become parents know? But it's possible that there are a big support network of people out there. There are many online groups uh, on social media where, you know, if you type in parenting with disability, there are just so many wonderful groups of people, community waiting to support you. And there are ways to adapt and parent in a way that suits you. And that I think we, we live in a world that is inaccessible often and also that has a lot of stigma when it comes to disability. But I think people with disability, because we live in a world that's inaccessible, we've had to really navigate that and learn all these wonderful skills of flexibility, being creative thinkers, problem solvers, adaptable, all of those skills end up really serving you well when you decide to be a parent. I've realized that I have patience like no other. I can, you know, quickly be flexible with how my child is feeling, you know, any given day. And I think that those skills come from living with a disability. So I would say that actually if someone tells you not to because you're disabled, I would push back on that and say, I think I can do this and I just need the support around me to make it possible. And I think that's what your podcast and your book does as well. It just shares all those different examples of people that have found their way. And there are so many different ways of doing this and, and becoming parents and, and becoming a village and being, you know, creating that kind of the family that you want and the and yeah. people around you that you need as well. It's not just the down the straight path that everyone yeah. has this. Exactly. And I think disability looks like all different things. It might look like being blind or being deaf or having a chronic illness. And I think what the book and the podcast shows is that actually being a parent with disability ends up creating these beautiful kids that are resilient and also accepting of difference and others and kind humans, like all the kids I've, you know, that I was able to go into the houses to interview these families for the podcast. And the kids are all like incredibly kind. You know, I don't think that's a mistake. I think that that comes from having a parent with a disability that might have done things slightly different. And, you know, for instance, some parents that have chronic illness, they might live a bit of a slower life but actually I've noticed that those kids have like an appreciation for like you know walking a bit slower and smelling the flowers and taking things in instead of being like this constant rush to life they live a slower life and it actually is really beautiful I'm wondering if you can share a bit about what kinds of stigma you have experienced and and what that has meant for you and your children I guess you know last night was it was an example funnily enough Last night, someone came up to me and said, where do I know your limp from? And it's like, you know, and that was in front of my kids. So it's it's like, 
you know, why did you bring that up? Why did you bring up the way that I walked in that way instead of just saying, like, where have I seen your face? Or funnily enough, at the same venue that we were all at for dinner, I had another person say to me that, oh, you know, I, I do know, you know, you know you in the same group and I see you wobbling around town um, and you're constantly hobbling in and out of the fruit and veg shop. And it's like, I think it's just that language that, you know, hobbling and wobbling. I really don't feel like it, it is it's an explainer of, of who I am actually. And I think that that confuses my kids because they see an empowered person that speaks about their disability in a really positive way, not in a, a kind of deficit language. This particular person also said, like, how could I be happy having a disability? Uh, again, that made my eldest daughter like very confused because I am a happy person. I live a great life. So I think it's this kind of constant pushback on the way that society sees disability. And in our home, you know, difference in all of its uh, ways is something that's not feared. It's it's celebrated. So I think, you know, those little things that you face daily are, are the hard things. One other example is when I was lining up to the kindergarten with my daughter, this was a couple of years back, and a child said to their mother, why does she walk like that? What is wrong with her? And, you know, that's fine because he's a child and he doesn't have that kind of education and disability awareness. But uh, it was interesting that only a couple of weeks back I had been speaking to that particular mother, telling her that I was a disability advocate, I, I have a disability, I've got a book out about having a disability and yet she said to her son in front of me that I'd been in an accident and that there was, you know, something had happened. So again, it's that kind of stigma that comes with the word disability, but also the associations that come with having a disability. And I think people are often, you know, and I, I guess I don't want to say that that is their fault, but people are mostly afraid of the word and afraid of, of getting it wrong. And I think that's because of such a lack of representation of disability that we've seen historically, you know, in the media, on TV. We just haven't really seen it and we not only have we not seen it, but we've never really seen it in that positive way or, or even just a neutral way that actually it's neither positive or negative, it just is and that that is society, we are different and that's what's wonderful. So I think, I think that's where stigma comes from and I, I guess daily I get stared at, daily people will tell their child not to look at me. You know, there's often groups of people that have generally men where they might laugh or point. And I think that's really hard for the kids to see those things uh, take place because, again, they don't see me in that light. They don't see that my disability is something to be laughed at. And in those situations when you do have your kids with you, how do you help them make sense of what's going on? I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty st like straightforward with them. I think it's important that we, we, we obviously speak in a way that's age appropriate, but I try and just say that, you know, for, for, for a lot of us as, as older people, we just really haven't had those beautiful children's books that we now have, you know, that has disability in them, that we're really starting to see that shift of um, representation and that because of not really seeing many people with disability and often people with disability have been segregated at, you know, at work or segregated at schooling. And so we didn't really get to experience the, the diversity as we do today. And I think it's, it's, it's just kind of talking about the why that this could still be happening, why people might think that disability is something that is to be feared or to be laughed at and that hopefully more conversations and more books, more picture books for kids that we can start to change that. I'm wondering if we talk about books because we did speak previously about when you did read a story to your child's class. Are there big or small ways that you found to respond to stigma and, and how it's affected your family? Yeah, so I guess there's two examples there. One is in the book we've got this, is a very good friend of mine, Mandy McCracken, who she has a, she's a quadruple amputee, which means that she had sepsis, which was a, an infection, and she had both her arms and legs amputated. And she was really experienced discrimination when she would drop her kids off at the school. Kids would be hiding from her. They would be scared of her and they wouldn't want to come up and speak to her. And then that really impacted her children. So she decided to, instead of like trying to ignore it or do anything other than 
you know, what she thought would be actually the, the thing that really needed to happen, which was to go into the school and take all her prosthetic attachments. So her different arms that, you know, she uses, she also uses a, a hook prosthetic attachment and she took them all in and, and gave them around to the room and said, this is what I use and this is what happened to me. And I'd, I identify as having a disability. And would you like to ha- have a feel of, of my arm? And would you like to have a feel of the, the hook? And then kids were like, loving her because it took away that stigma it made the kids feel part of it and that's something I'm really trying to do as well because often when I was dropping my kids off the kids would be staring at the way I look and I was really you know I don't want my kids to feel that feeling of just like being on show and so I decided to go into every single class in my daughter's school, which took a whole day <laughs> and did read my children's book, which is called Come Over to My House, and then sang a song that I'd written about disability and showed one of my music videos because I'm a musician as well, of me walking and, and there's a disabled dancer in that. And then just spoke about my lived experience of how when I was a child, what you know, I had a disability and I would use a wheelchair throughout school and just ways that we can talk about disability and just to tell the kids that it's not something that needs to be scary or something that needs to be feared. It's just what makes this world and, and you know, diversity is what really makes it a beautiful world. And then I got the kids to do a drawing of ways that they can make the world more accessible and to really help them understand the social model of disability, which is that the world is disabling and it's not something we don't need to fix the person. We need to make the world more accessible so that people can live in a way that is inclusive. And so the kids drew things that I hadn't even thought about. Like, yeah, it was absolutely incredible, like lowered ice cream trucks for for people that were wheelchair users or ways to get into the park for everybody, you know, ramps up and a swing and a slide for wheelchair users and just all these really incredible ideas. And I think that just made me feel so incredibly proud and happy because kids are the future. And if they're seeing the ways that we can change the world and seeing disability is not a, a, a deficit or a negative, but seeing that the world is actually the, the thing that is disabling, I think that's a really beautiful telling of where the future is going. Yeah. If we could all like be more in the kid world and not so much the adult world, I think it would all be, you know, it seems like they came up with just amazing ideas and just giving them that opportunity as well. Yeah, exactly. Why is disability not in the curriculum? I don't really understand that considering 20% of the population have a disability. I'm wondering about unsolicited advice, which I'm sure you have, you know, received in your time. How do you manage that unsolicited advice that comes your way? Yeah, I think like I always listen to people's advice, but I just try and keep knowing who I am, knowing my own limitations instead of believing in others' <laughs> ideas of what, what those limitations are. You know, an example of that is even people I, the closest to me might say, you can't walk holding your, your child down the stairs and you should never even consider going down the stairs with your child and then I was like well I go down the stairs in a different way with my child like as soon as my child could you know move we would go down the stairs like one by one like on our bums like I have stairs out of front of my house so it was only six stairs but we would just make it a fun game so that we could both get down the stairs together safely so I guess it's like realizing that of course I'm going to do everything in my power to be as safe as possible you know all this idea that I shouldn't get my child out of the cot again I was I always held on to the cot as I was getting my child out would have the chair right near me it was everything was calculated and I guess it was just realizing that I can do this and there was never anything that would jeopardize my child's safety or put my child at risk so I think it's like trying not to listen to those things and also realizing that like we have as people with disability the skills to use adaptive technology in a way that really assists us like for instance, when my children were babies, I would use assistive technology to give them a bath safely. So there's a way that you don't have to use your hand so much. It's like an insert into the bath that keeps them safe. And so it's like everything that you do is 
is is done in a way that A is is safe, but B uses those skills that I was talking about, those problem solving skills, adaptive technology. And so I think I've just had to to know know who I am, know my own limitations and try not to to, to listen too much. Of course, you know, there are times where people might give me great advice. So I'm not saying that, but there are some times where you just don't don't actually need it. I think that's some great advice for our listeners as well and our audience of managing that unsolicited advice, like what you said, like trusting yourself and almost knowing your, you know, your, your body. And I think I learned that the most through birthing my two kids. For the first birth, I wasn't allowed to move from the bed in case I did fall when I was giving birth. Luckily, due to my own learning and, and advocating and, and listening to others with disability and obviously making the book before I had my second child. And then going into that second birth going, no, I am going to move actually. And I know that I have a right to. And then having the most incredible birth you know, in the shower and moving around and on the ball. And I was like, this is what I should have been allowed to do the first time. So again, it's just that trust yourself and you know your own body better than anybody else. This is kind of touching on what we were talking about as well, but how have you navigated when you're not being listened to? If you have any advice to our listeners about if you're not being listened to. I think like just like, you know, staying strong in yourself you know, researching as much as you can to know your rights because I think that we can often get pressured into believing that we have no power when that is actually not the case. Uh, Also finding community. So, you know, finding local community, support groups, people out there that have similar experiences to you so you feel less alone. I think that making the book and the podcast uh, really brought all of those parents together and I think we were like, oh, like you're going through that as well. It's so nice to have people on the same, like dealing with something that you feel often can feel really alone in and isolated in. So I think, you know, finding community and again, going back to that, trusting yourself, knowing your rights, researching as much as you can to be as educated as possible. It's it's really my advice. When we're talking to children about disabilities, what are some helpful ways that you have found to talk to your kids about disability or stigma? For me, it's like not being afraid to say disability. Like I think that we are definitely moving into a time now where we are not using, you know, euphemisms like differently abled, special, handicapped. You know, there's been a lot of disability slurs that were used to describe people with disability. And now we're moving into a time where I think, you know, everyone identifies in different ways that maybe somebody identifies as autistic or might identify as deaf and and not disabled or or having a chronic illness. So I think it's about trying to to teach children that it's important to, to know that we all might speak about ourselves in different ways. But I think I try and I guess, for, you know, to use my own lived experience to try and just teach my kids that there's so many people in this world that have a disability, that some people are born with disabilities, some people acquire them later in life. Sometimes it might be that people find it difficult to find their own community or their own identity and that it might take certain people time to even identify with the word, but that doesn't mean that it is a a bad word or something that we should be scared of and that it can actually make families really fun. (laughs) I think that, as I said, I made a children's book called Come Over to My House and each family are really like, you know, vibrant. There's a lot of colour in the the illustrations and you know for instance there's a mother in that book that's deaf and she's dancing with her kids and the music is going and she might not hear the music but she feels the vibrations and I think it's just that again showing that yes we might do things differently but there's nothing wrong with that and it's okay to be different. Yeah I love that it's definitely okay to be different. What about when stigma can turn into shame? Have you found ways to stop this happening or how do you, when you feel that creeping in? It's such a great question and I think it's not something that you can ever, in my opinion, completely solve. (laughs) Uh, I think take each day as they come and um, some days it just, some days you feel it more. 
I can't really know why that is, um, why sometimes it hurts more, why sometimes a stigma can turn into shame. But I think the shift that I've found within myself, it's taken a long, long time to feel okay with who I am. But I think once I started to realize that, you know, as I was saying, that the world is quite disabling and that, you know, I can go to my friend's house for dinner and go into their house and get get straight through the door. And then other times I might go somewhere and they've got 12 steps that I can't get up. And it's like they're the different experiences that I can have in, in the physical world where one world is really disabling, one world I'm, I'm able to be included and I think that that can really also be people's attitudes. So, you know, people saying that disability is bad or how could I be happy, you know, living my life. And that, that really used to hurt me when I believed it. But I think once you start to shift and see the value in yourself, understand that you make a contribution to the world and that you are wonderful and beautiful just the way you are, that's when through that kind of self-love and being authentic and true to yourself, knowing who you are, knowing your own power, that's when you shift the power away from them and you go, actually, you know what? Like, I, I think that you are just feeding me information that you've been taught over the many years and that actually I'm really comfortable with myself and I live a great life. So it's just like kind of flipping that narrative. But it's not always easy and there's still one thing today that I still struggle with and that is going to the pool or the beach. So we've got a family holiday coming up to Thailand with a group of family friends, you know, three families, and it's really stressing me out because my legs look different, my feet look different, I've got toes that curl, I've got scars all over my feet. My feet looked, well, you know, slightly, I guess, what you'd call de deformed in that because I've had so much surgery, they look very different. And the way that I walk, they kind of flop on the ground. And so I guess it's the most visible part of my disability is when I'm, you know, going to the pool and you can see my legs and feet. And I still hold a lot of shame. And that's still really, really tricky. And I feel like I'm going to get there. Like, I feel like I'm going to be able to one day just push through that. And, and again, just remembering that it's not me that needs to change and I don't need to be fixed. Like I am who I am. I'm, you know, I'm wonderful. It's just that, again, that self-love, self-talk that can flip the narrative around and try and realize that. Probably people might not even care or be worrying about their own bodies or thinking about themselves. Or what I'm, I guess I want to say is that don't guilt yourself if you feel shame. And it's a constant, you know, day by day and it's constant kind of self-work and it takes time. I think really a strong message to send because it does happen and, you know, it takes work to get through it what would you want those who do not have lived experience of navigating a disability to know about how to stand against the stigma and support families who do so you know a question that gets asked a lot from able-bodied parents is what do they do if their child is staring at someone with a visible disability so what is your advice to them in that situation yeah, that's it's very tricky. I feel I really feel for parents. Um, it's tricky on on a couple of levels, but one is that you know I think it's really important that we don't tell people to look away. You know, in a way, or or like don't don't look, don't you know engage with that person is is kind of what you're saying. So if you're a child, you're basically being told that that person is a problem. And that you shouldn't be looking at that person because they're different. And, you know, it almost kind of reinforces the stigma that comes with disability in a, in a, in a way. I, I feel that because I, I know what it feels like when a parent says that to a child. I've been on the other end of it. It makes you feel like you are a pro like it's almost like you're a monster, to be honest, a little bit. But the other part of that is that it's not really up to people with disability to be answering lots of questions about their own bodies and lives. 
And I know that a lot of people with disability have children and parents that are trying to do the right thing and going like, okay, well, we don't want to push you away from like st- staring and sh- don't look, don't look, this, you're not allowed to look. So they, they might co- go up to the person and just say, you know, like my child was just wondering, you know, why you have a facial difference or why you walk like that or why you're in a wheelchair. And I think some people with disability really appreciate that because it, it's the way in and you'll find that you might answer the question and then suddenly it's like the child's like, and what is it like going down like the, the hill on the wheelchair and it suddenly flips it and it's like, and then suddenly they don't care and they're like, I love you, you know, your hat or, you know, they'll start talking about other things. So I think some people with this disability really appreciate it. But then I guess there's others that might think, you know what, it's not up to me to educate your child. And so I think that then goes back to trying to get more representation in your home. So if you have more conversations with your children about disability and you have more picture books of, you know, all the representation that, you know, of people that are blind, people that are deaf, people that have dwarfism and all people that have limb difference and might use a hook and how using a hook is not uh, something that's evil which has been portrayed in, you know, all the kids' films, really. It's, you know, think about Captain Hook or, or a scar or a hook has been used to portray somebody that is, is bad and evil. Whereas, like, flipping that and going, no, a hook is great for somebody that, you know, needs it to pick things up and it's, you know, incredible that they use it. So flipping that narrative for children. I think you'll find if you have those conversations, you have those picture books, they're not going to be that interested when they're out in the world because they've already spoken about it. And I think you're so right about the lack of education and the lack of representation, because as soon as you describe it to a kid, they're like, oh, okay, cool. Got it. I guess from your experience and from the conversations you've had with other families, Eliza, do you find that parents navigating a disability and their children in particular have some invisible skills that other families don't have? Yeah, definitely. Like, just as I said, for that kind of ability to quickly problem solve. Like I know a parent that has dwarfism that couldn't change her baby on the change table because it was too tall and go, oh, well, I'll just cut the legs off. <laughs> like, and then just stand it back. So it's like perfectly stable and it's just the right height now. So it's just like that quick thinking or like finding the right technology to get your baby out of the car or, you know, using a big tray on your wheelchair so that then when you're holding your baby, they can be held by you and the tray. Or, you know, just finding fun ways to make your wheelchair part of your parenting. So I've, you know, seen lots of parents that when their children are at the age of roller skating, well, they're holding onto the wheelchair and they're roller skating with their parent, you know, on the, the netball courts. And yeah, it's just incredible to watch kids see it as, as something that can be fun and exciting. I think the way that we as people with disability are really resilient in the way that we have been told that we shouldn't be a parent, that we can't be, you know, like it could be too hard, that it's often the narrative, but we still do it anyway. And I think that that's incredibly rebellious in many ways, but in a, in a really strong way. So I think that they're our skills. And I think, as I said, that kind of flexibility and adaptability in, in how we live our lives in, in our home and how we show kids what's possible. I was just wondering, when you say um, there is a community out there, if someone's listening and they're just like, I don't have a community or I don't know where to even start, do you have anywhere you would direct anyone to? Yeah, so if you are a parent with a disability? Yeah. So um, on social media, if you type in Disability Parenting Project, there's 8,000 of us (laughs) that exist in the world and it's a really supportive group. So that's one. If you're a mother, there's disabled mums. We are an Australian group. We also meet in person sometimes and also online, just constant advice giving and just sometimes just people there to listen as well. So it's it's definitely there waiting for you. And I guess also the book, you know, we've got this is a really great resource if you are a, a person with disability or chronic illness that might just want to feel less alone in either your decision to become a parent or just in your parenting that you can kind of feel the sense of community that is within that book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have a final message you'd like to leave our audience with? You know, just don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Believe in in who you are. 
And I guess, you know, if you are a person with disability, know that it is completely possible and that there is a large group of people waiting for you in the community that are ready to support you and give you advice and tips and little hacks that we've found that work and that you can do it even if you've been told you can't. And I guess, you know, if you are a parent with a disability to go gentle on yourself and just try and block out the people that tell you that, you know, or make you feel shame or, you know, stare or maybe point that you are just, yeah, incredible parent and that you've got this. Thank you so much, Eliza, for sharing so much of yourself um, with us today. No, thanks so much for the opportunity. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au forward slash families for a wide range of free information and resources to help support child and family mental health. Emerging Minds leads the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health. The centre is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Program.